week two. This is where we are. We are in 1 John chapter 1. We're going to be picking it up in verse 5. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, uh, I'm going to uh, run through where we were last week, where we're going to be going this week, so we kind of know where we're heading. Uh, last week, we were in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, which is the prologue of 1 John. And what we started off talking about is how there's these similarities between the gospel of John in chapter 1 and its prologue, and then 1 John's prologue. Go back and listen to all the details there. The one thing that I'll mention is that I am making the assumption, and I think it is a right one, uh, that John assumes that his audience is familiar with the gospel that he wrote. Um, so we talked about that, and then we went through uh, this sensory evidence of those things that we have heard, which we have seen. It's mentioned in verses 1, 2, and 3, uh, the things that we touch, the things that we examined. We talked about that sensory evidence and why it's a big deal when we talk about proto-Gnosticism. We talked about Jesus' divinity and humanity, and then John's invitation for fellowship, and then his first purpose of writing there in verse 4 is so that our joy may be made complete. And so, if you want more, more information, go check out last week. So, where we are heading this week is we are going to be covering about seven verses or so. Nothing crazy, right? We're going to be picking it up in chapter 1, verse 5, and we're going to talk about um, the apostolic message. So this carries a lot of uh, weight considering who the we were um, from last week. We'll talk about that. And then we're going to talk about three denials that are made about sin. We're going to group verses 6 and 7, 8 and 9, and then verse 10 by itself. And then we're going to look at verses 1 and 2 to wrap up John's second purpose for writing and then we're going to talk about propitiation. So let me just pause right there. How many of you have ever heard the word propitiation? How many of you know what propitiation means? How many of y'all could tell me what pro propitiation entails? That's what we're going to do, right? That's what we're going to talk about. So, and then we're going to have our discussion questions, and then we're going to talk about reviewing our homework. Uh, just as a reminder, what was your homework for this session? What were y'all supposed to be working on doing? Besides looking at the discussion questions, what was the other bit? Memorize what? First John 1 John 1.9. Incidentally, we're going to be looking at 1 John 1 John 1.9 tonight. As a heads up, we're probably going to rehearse our memorization of 1 John 1 John 1.9 when we get there. Hint, hint. All right, so if you need to cram, do that now. All right, let me read for us 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 5, going all the way to chapter 2, verse 2. This is what John writes for us. He says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. However, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Chapter 2, verse 1, my little children. You're going to see John address the audience multiple times directly, and he's going to call them my children, my little children. This is what he says. My little children, I am writing these things to you, what I just wrote. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous or the righteous one. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's pray, and then we're going to dive into each one of these verses. Father, I thank you that we have this uh, clear message from our brother John. Um, God, I thank you for um, the way in which John recalls to mind the very words of Jesus, and that we will see that uh, throughout this study. God, I thank you that you have given us everything that we need to be able to rightly understand this, because we have your spirit. Um, but God, as we are working through this, I pray that you would give us everything we need practically in the removal of distractions and us being able to have uh, clear thoughts and uh, attentive ears. God, I pray that you would give that to us tonight. And as is my custom, I would ask that you would pray for me and that the words I say would be beneficial, that they would be accurate, and that I would say nothing that is out of harmony with the gospel. If you would, pray for me.
Father, I'm thankful for being able to teach tonight, be able to look at some very basic, um, yet also deep truths. God, I pray that you would give uh, me unction to speak as I ought, that you would give me the very things uh, that I need in the in just the explanation of these individual verses, and that, God, that what I say would be honoring to you, and it would be edifying for us, and that, God, that you would uh, be the one that receives the glory for this. So, Father, we thank you for this time. We pray that you would send your spirit to help us in this endeavor, and we ask all of this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we picked up, I just want to pick up one thing. We're going to look at chapter 1, verse 5, and if you look in chapter 1, verse 5, the first thing that John says is, this is the message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. Now, what was one of the questions that I told you that we were going to continue to ask over and over in 1 John? It's a really dumb question, but what's the question that I said that we were going to have to ask? Who is we? Right? Whenever we were in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, whenever we see John say that that which we have heard and seen with our eyes and looked upon and felt, who was the we in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4? Who was we there? The apostolic witness. So John, along with the, the other apostles, are the ones who tangibly saw Jesus. Now, what has happened here is that there is this message that he has heard from the beginning, and now he is going to communicate that to us. But what we're going to see, especially in this next bit, I'm going to highlight it again there in verse 6, um, the we is going to change. So I just want to point that out to you. So here, when John says that he is relaying this message, that which we have heard from the beginning, from Jesus, about God, we're given to you. So this is the apostolic witness still, but then when we get to verse 6, it's going to transition. I just want to give you the heads up on that. So what John says is, this is the message. If we know nothing else about how John describes the message, this is it. God is light. Now, anybody want to take a stab of where Jesus actually talked about how God is light in any of the Gospels? Anybody know where that is? Probably John. What you will find is that Jesus will claim that he is the light of the world. But nowhere in the Gospels or in John specifically do we see Jesus say that God is light. Now, here's my point that I want to make. What is going on here is John is consolidating and condensing the gospel message about what light entails and what it is that Jesus is the light of the world, and he just truncates that in this statement of, this is what we've heard. We heard about the Father from Jesus, God is light. That is essentially who he is, right? And he is essentially saying that not only is this something that is so pivotal, he is going to basically spend the first half of 1 John constantly calling back to light and darkness. One of our discussion questions we're going to talk about at the end here is what comes to mind whenever you hear the word light or what what images bring uh, are brought up in your mind from the Bible when you hear God is light? We're going to talk about that, okay? The first half of 1 John is really God is light. The last half of 1 John, after chapter 3, verse 11, does anybody know what God is described as there? He's not light, but he is love. So you can actually crack all of 1 John in half. And the first half is going to be really talking about light and darkness, and we're going to see that over and over again. And then the second half, we're really going to hit on this idea of love, okay? So whenever Jesus is preaching the message of the gospel, repent um, and believe in me, I am the son of man, that there is salvation to be found nowhere else, it is with me. And the apostles have been doing that all through Acts, and then John's lifetime in preaching, whenever he is truncating all of that together, he says, God is light, that is who he is. Now, I want to ask y'all, I'm reading from the ESV. How many of y'all have another translation other than ESV? I know we've got King James back here. New King James? New International? Okay, I want you to read New International Version for me, if you would, Joanne, chapter 1, verse 5. In him there is no darkness at all. Does anyone have another translation other than in him there is no darkness at all? Maybe a translation that says no darkness whatsoever. Yep. There's absolutely no darkness. 
Well, let me tell you something that's really cool about what John does is he throws out an emphatic double negative, okay? In English, if I were to tell you a double negative or I were to use a double negative, the first thing you would go is like, okay, what? Like, what is this guy talking about? And in English, that's really bad grammar. In Greek, it's really good grammar because what it does is it emphasizes, and I want to show you here, that's skotia, that's darkness, in him, is, and then this is not, so this is the negation of is. So in him, there is no darkness, and then oidema, there at the end, is whatsoever or not again. So when you read this, you should be reading when John says, this is the message that we have heard from the beginning and we are proclaiming to you that in him there is no darkness. None. That's important because what happens in verses 6 through the end of the chapter? What is he then talking about? What's the topic of verses 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10? Sin. So what's actually going to happen is that John is laying out this fundamental idea of who God is, that he is Phos, he is light. This is where we get our word for photon. He is light. And in him, there is no, no darkness. There is no darkness whatsoever. There is absolutely no darkness. Are you tracking with that? When he says, this is the message, God is perfect, he is light. Hold on to some of those ideas. We'll come back around to them in the discussion questions, yeah? So, in him, there's no darkness whatsoever is the way that I would translate that. And the reason this is important is because this is an essential element to who God is, okay? All right, any questions about chapter 1, verse 5? Chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, that which we heard, we saw, we touched, we examined, we proclaim to you, chapter 1, verse 5, that which we have heard from him about God, we proclaimed. And then we get to verse 6 and 7. Let's read that one more time. Verse 6 says this. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. This is where John is going to talk about this first denial about sin and the meaning of we has shifted. So I must ask our question, who is we? The readers, okay? So Paul says, so the readers. So, he, and notice that John is in fact including himself, because he says we. He doesn't say you all. He says we, okay? What's another option? Believers, I heard that. Professing believers, okay. The apostles. So here's my point. I think what he's doing here is he is including himself to heighten anyone. If there is anyone who says this, here's what we know about the truth of that statement, okay. And so he is even adding himself into this category and saying, look, this is that big of a deal that even if I, as part of the apostolic witness, were to say, I have fellowship with God, but I'm walking in darkness, no big deal, then he would be falling into the category as the one who would be lying and not practicing the truth. Are you seeing that? So John is actually elevating how big a deal it is to make this denial. So what is the nature of this denial? I would say it this way. Anyone who would say this, they're claiming that their sin does not break fellowship with God. I've got fellowship with God. Yeah, but you, you, you walk in darkness, right? Doesn't that break fellowship? Nah. Really? And here is essentially the denial that's being made. We, if we make this statement, we are claiming, and essentially what we are doing are lying to others if our beliefs don't actually line up with our actions. Are you seeing that? If our actions contradict our statements about what we, do, or what we say we do, we're a liar. You lie, and the truth is not in you. Okay? I want to read this for you. This is what uh, Danny Aiken says about these three denials, and I think this is the appropriate place to read it. He says, We will discover that he, speaking of John, takes sin very seriously, and also Jesus, because... He's the one who told us about how God is light. 
So we will discover that he takes sin very seriously. John rhetorically uses three if we say statements to help us see sin as we ought and see sin as God sees sin. In the process, a healthy theology of lying is addressed. You're going to start seeing the metaphor about light being paired with dark. And whenever we start lining up all the other uh, word pictures that John's going to use, he's going to talk about light and dark, and he's going to talk about truth and lying. So you could actually see, anytime he's talking about light, you could read true. Anytime you see darkness, you can infer lying. Okay? We'll build that over time. That's actually going to just pick up steam over the next two chapters. Okay? So he says that we will contradict what we say by our actions. And when we do that, we actually do break fellowship with God, that there is an issue here. And what we see there in verse five, uh, excuse me, verse six, he says, if we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, does anyone have another translation of while we walk in darkness? Uh, anything else than what I just read there? And walk in darkness. Any other translations? They're all basically going to say that, but here's the technical aspect of this. This is in the present tense, and so what John says is, if you continue to keep on walking, I've got fellowship with God, but I keep on walking in darkness. There is a pattern here, and that walking is indicating this ongoing, consistent, continuous pattern. But yet the denial is, ah, man, my, my sin doesn't actually mess up my fellowship with God. We're good but yet you're making a habit of continually walking in darkness. And what does he say? No. You lie and the truth is not in you. And not only that, he says that that not walking in the light, that walking in darkness affects not only our fellowship with God, but also your salvation. Do you, do you see how he makes that shift from, it's not just this fellowship that's affected, your salvation is hindered in some way, that, that we can make some inferences there. Look at the end of verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, this does not mean that you can be saved by right actions. That's not at all what John's saying. Because remember, the purpose of writing that we're going to see here in a bit um, in chapter 2, verse 1, and then what we've already seen in chapter 1, verse 4, is that he is writing so that we may have joy and that our fellowship would be complete in that way. And whenever you're not walking in the light, as he is in the light, we'll see in a bit, it's going to mess some stuff up. Are you seeing that? So the first denial is that my sin does not break fellowship with God. And John actually ratchets it up and says, no, if you're walking in the light, you're absolutely in the clear. But if you're in the darkness, the truth's not in you. How could you know rightly that you're saved? And I think the inference is you won't. And if you're not confident of your salvation, how much joy do you have? None. All right, let me stop right there. Any comments about 1, 6, and 7? Yeah, not practicing the truth is another way that that's an ongoing is leading that idea, right? That present tense. Sue? So. Well, I guess uh, I, my time frame of, of messed up is Absolutely right. Do you remember the name of that group? I said it last week. I don't know if you remember it, though. Does anybody remember the, the groups that John is most likely addressing? We're getting that to the next slide explicitly, but let's go ahead and talk about it. So you're, you're right on it. Yes. The answer is yes. Say it again. Gnostics is the answer, and we don't really know about the time frame specifically, so at least we would say the way I'm using it is proto-Gnostic, like the initial stages of Gnosticism. Yep. And there was another group, the Docetists. And they're a very similar group. They said that Jesus wasn't really the Christ. He seemed like a man, but he wasn't really a man, right? 
And so they would fundamentally agree in some level with the Gnostics in that spiritual things are good, material things are bad, and there's a clear separation, which is exactly what you're getting at. So in that theory, yeah, my sin and what I do on here on earth doesn't affect my fellowship with God because it's so disjointed. But what John says is you can't separate them. They are one and the same. Sue? Mm -hmm. Yep. So the question is, which group believed that Jesus was a man, but that at his baptism, that's whenever the Christ descends on him, he lives the next three years as Jesus, who is the Christ, and then right before his execution on the cross is when the Christ leaves him, and that Jesus dies. Um, there are several heretical groups that kind of fall in line with this, and this is what I'm saying, it's hard to tell. Docetists, Docetists kind of live in that area. Gnostics kind of live in that. But the guy's name that I mentioned last week was Corinthus or Serinthus, was a dude who actually taught that very thing. Was he a Docetist? Was he a proto-Gnostic? He wouldn't have used those terms. He would have said, no, no, this is how life actually is. But there's your answer. Like, this was something, because there are no geographical or historical markers in 1 John, it's hard to place exactly when this was going on. But we know these things were in and around about the time that we think that John wrote. So that's, we're taking our best stab at this. But that's why I took pains to talk about those sensory evidences in verses 1, 2, and 3, because it seems to be addressing that issue, right? So this is where we get to the next step of the argument. When we read that the we has shifted, now we've got a new category of who we might be, correct? Who could this new category of we be? Those proto-gnostics. Those docetists, those guys who were following, following Serenthus, they may have legitimately said, my fellowship's not broken with God by my sin. And he is using their very statements and saying, if any of us, including me, say that, here's what the real matter, here's what the real truth of the matter is. Make sense? So now you're seeing those come together. Yep. All right. Verses 6 and 7. I promise you everything else is going to go a lot quicker. Ed. Mm -hmm. Darkness is the absence of light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and so, Ed, your comment there about, like, even just practically, we know that whenever there are things that are happening that are not good, right, nothing good happens after... And then you fill in the blank, right? <laughs> it's just sun up. Um, a lot of times after midnight, 1 o'clock, depending on how, how loose and fast with the rules your parents were about how late you could stay out. But, like, the whole point there is at night, there's this seeming veil that I can get away with something. And what John is saying in a very spiritual sense with your translation, you're walking in spiritual darkness, and that's showing itself by whenever someone exposes that through the light. We'll see that in 1 John as well. Yeah. All right. Dave? We'll talk about the Antichrist in three weeks from now, so hold on to those thoughts until then, okay? All right. All right, let's look at verses 8 and 9. This is now the second denial. Verse 8, if we say, and if you're going to anticipate a question, I'm going to ask, what should that question be? Who is we? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. However, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Excellent. So, here's the question. Who is we? I think it's the exact same group as verse 6 and 7. Anyone who would say this thing, and I think he does have in mind whoever his opponents are, whoever the false teachers are, this is a statement that they would make. They would make a statement similar to, ah, you know, I got no sin. Not a big deal. And what John says, if there's ever anyone who says that, they are deceiving themselves. So here's the, the basic statement. They're saying that sin does not exist in my nature. Okay? We're going to have to nerd out and get a little technical here. Look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, singular, 
Okay, does anyone have a singular or a plural there? Sin as opposed to sins. There should be sin. That is a singular uh, noun there, okay? Later on, we're going to see sins, plural, individual. That's actually in verse 9. Here's the point, is that whenever you use that singular, he's talking about conceptually. I don't have any sin, and what is going on most likely is there is this claim that it doesn't exist in my nature because body is bad, spirit is good. What does it matter in my nature? I'm not that anyway. I'm some spirit. I'm going to be liberated at some point. Yeah? You see how those work together? So this is essentially the denial. They are essentially lying about the presence of sin in their lives. And if you take that to just the next step, their claim is actually... I'm sinless. Can you think of any verse in the Bible that might say, actually, that's not true? Any singular verse, maybe? All of sin. That's a very great one, right? I mean, just, man, flip open your Bible and you'll probably just find one randomly, right? But the essential claim is, it's not in my nature and I'm sinless. And that's a problem, right? So, what John says is, Lying to others about sin, which is with the previous denial, it doesn't break my fellowship with God. That's one thing. But here he says, you're lying to yourself. That is utter deception. What hope do you have to walk in the truth or in the light if you've deceived yourself? What hope do you have? None. When you get later in chapter 5, whenever he's writing these things so that you might know that you have eternal life, he's giving us all sorts of parameters to say, yeah, I know that I know Jesus because, fill in the blank from previous portions of the book. But what he's saying here is if you're so self-deceived that you think you have no sin at all, there's no real hope for you. You seeing that? So he gives us now the antidote. And it's a theological antidote, and it is confession. If we confess our, what does your translation say? Sin or sins, plural. Here, John says, I want you to have this, let's go ahead and put it up there, particular confession about individual sins. Now, we are not Catholic. We do not believe in these last rite kind of methodologies of if you die with any unconfessed sin, that you're going to like bear that um, in any kind of like purgatory ideal. That is not at all what John is saying. What he is getting at is you've made the claim that there is no sin in general, in concept in your life. And what he says is, no, you need to confess every single one that comes to your mind. That's how big a deal this is. Because if any of us say that we got no sin, bah, you're self-deceived. And the solution is particular confession and that that debt is paid by Jesus and he removes the stains. Okay, did you pick up on that in chapter 1, verse 9? Because he says there, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He is faithful and righteous. Okay, that's going to be really critical for us here in a second. He's the righteous one, just, to forgive and cleanse. So we have this idea of expiation. We'll talk about that here very briefly. But he's saying that I'm going to remove the debt. It's been paid. It's been forgiven. And I'm going to wipe away the stains of sin. You can't have that if you make the claim, I have no sin. Right? Cool? All right, verses 8 and 9. Any comments that y'all have, questions? Their waywardness, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'm, I'm tracking, I don't remember where in the Psalms where we have that reference of uh, that there are these unforeseen, unknown sins that I'm 
just not cognizant of, and the prayer in the psalm is protect me from those, and then reveal those ones to me, right? With the implication of, so I can confess it, okay? This is what R.W. Stott says about verse 9, that God is, or Jesus, excuse me, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our debt and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He says this, God is faithful to forgive because he has promised to do so. Faithful, promised, I'm going to give it to you. You ask for it, I give it to you. Faithful. And he is just because his son died for our sins. That is how he is faithful and just. Need to have both of those? We'll come back around to this. Talk about that in a bit. Did you find the reference, Sue? Psalm 19, verses 12 and 13. Write that down, somebody. Okay? All right, other comments, questions about this second denial? All right, first denial. My sin doesn't affect fellowship, and that's what I'm telling to them. I'm lying to them. The second denial is I don't even have sin in my nature. <laughs> you might, but I don't. I actually don't sin at all, and that's a deception. The third denial is a little bit different, and it's actually like ramping up. Look at verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, does anyone have another translation other than have not sinned? What time frame are we talking about here? What tense is that? Past. Okay. I don't sin. It's not in my nature. And here they're saying I haven't sinned in the past. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. So here's the third denial. The third denial is basically saying I don't sin at all. My fellowship with God isn't broken with sin because I don't really do that anyway. It's not even in my nature. In fact, I don't sin at all. Because the essential denial is that God is not being truthful about my sin. It's actually saying, no, God is lying about presence, the presence of sin in my life. Because you notice that's what John says, that if we say we have not sinned, we make who a liar? God. This is, in fact, like the most blatant of the three denials, right? The second denial was sin's not in my nature. This denial is sin's not even in my past. Maybe for you, but not for me. And what's the antidote for all this? It's chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Right? We have got to see that chapter 1, verse 9 is going to be critical for us to come back to over and over and over again because John is going to take his finger and he's going to put it right in your chest and he's going to say, Oh, you say you love God? How well are you doing with loving your brother? And eventually what's going to happen, you're going to be like, well, well, I'm not doing so hot there. Well, then what you need is 1 John 1, 9. Incidentally, now is a perfect time for us to rehearse that. So, who has 1 John 1, 9 memorized? I'll go first. I'm reading from the ESV, and so if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Notice that unrighteousness, that word is actually the same basic word as just. So the one who is just removes all my injustice, my injustice, yeah? Somebody else who had their hand up, Dave? Well, you've got to say it, man. That's the whole point. I know that's correct. I know it's right. He is faithful and just. Keep working on that. Specificity matters, right? Whenever we are memorizing, specificity matters. So that's what we need to nail down. I've got a great approximate knowledge of many things, and that is almost useless when I need something specific, right? Anybody else who has that memorized? Rebecca? That's ESV? There it is. It sounds like ESV. That's, that's what ESV says. Somebody else? Christine? All right. Anybody else want to take a stab at it? All right. Kayla? Donald Whitney, in his book about spiritual disciplines, um, he 
he compares the word of God to a sword, right? I mean, that's what the word does. It compares itself to a sword. But he tweaks the analogy and says, okay, that's great. That's correct. Just for our purposes, don't imagine the Bible as a sword. Imagine the Bible as an armory full of swords. If all I got is John 3.16, that's a great sword to have. John 3.16 and that sword may not work for every single job that I got. So you can imagine the Holy Spirit's running around in your mind trying to find the one sword that he needs in this moment. And all you got is John 3.16. Okay, great. Let him, he's going to use it. I promise you. That's a great sword. But there are other swords that are good for other purposes. And what I'm trying to do is we're trying to pick out in 1 John those individual weapons that God can use in very particular ways. The first weapon you must have in 1 John is you have got to see that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Word? That's why we're doing this. Okay? Next week, we will still be memorizing 1 John 1, 9, and I'm going to call on at least four different people. Yeah? Got a whole other week. Comment? Question. Yes, ma'am. Faithful and righteous, yes. Mm -hmm. Which translation is better between just or righteous is the heart of the question because there's different connotations between the word just and justice and righteousness, right? That's essentially the question. Um, I think I would answer that by saying yes. I would say, the, I, I think if my general, my general bent is to say just because uh, whenever John and the biblical authors, when they write, there is an intentional effort to make sure there's not repetition when they don't mean for there to be repetition. So he might very well intend in the first reference of dikaios, I think is the word there. Maybe I just look at it. Yeah, dikaios is the word that gets used there. But what is happening at the very end of verse 9 is a dikaios. You see how those are different? A is just the negation. So we're going to run into the word gnosko here in a bit. And we're also going to run into ah gnosko, so knowledge or no knowledge. What word do we get from ah gnosko? Agnostic. I don't know. I can't know, actually. So here's my point. Whenever John is uh, writing, he is using the exact same word. One of them has the negation at the very beginning, that prefix. But when we translate it in English, we want to hear something that if it is intended repetition... We want to hear it, but if it's not, it actually throws us off. And I think that's why the translators go with just and then unrighteousness. Because if we say that he cleanses us from all injustice, that means something a little bit different. But we're talking about the character of God, and we're going to see here in just a bit in chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, um, uh, whenever we talk about Jesus, who is the Christ, the righteous one, the holy one, the the paraclete, the parakletos, there is meant to reply back to he is just and he is the one who is righteous. So it's kind of carrying both of those. I know that is an absolute non-answer. The question you are asking, though, is absolutely the nature of what Bible study is. So what Ashley is doing, whether or not you land on like a really satisfactory question, that's why I'm having you answer the question, who is we? Because what you're doing is you're slowing down, you're looking at this word, and you're saying, what are the implications of this exact word? So you're doing the exact right thing. So I just want to encourage you there. Even if I don't give you a great answer, you're doing the right thing. Yeah? Paul, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness and cleansing, there's a difference. What is it? Mm -hmm. I like that. So, yeah, it's something that happens that you have to have. So the illustration there is that if you've got kids on your way to church and they jump in a mud puddle, 
when you walk in the church, you can forgive them, but they're still going to have the mud on them, and they need the cleansing, but that is something that is going to be subsequent to that forgiveness. But those two things are both necessary for this situation to be fixed. Yeah, that's a good illustration. All right, other questions about the end of chapter 1? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, so the quote that I was reading from was, uh, was from R.W. Stott whenever he said, uh, God is faithful to forgive because he has promised to do so, and he is just because his son died for our sins. And so we're going to talk about that dying for our sins when we talk about propitiation in chapter 2, verse 2, Okay. So I might clear it up right there. If I don't, remind me, and we'll come back to it. Cool? All right. Let's drive on so we don't run out of time. We're now going to talk about John's second purpose for writing. He's going to tell us now there's a second purpose. How many purposes are there for his writing that he tells us in 1 John? The answer's four, right? You see one in chapter 1, verse 4, chapter 2, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 13, chapter 5, verse 9. Don't quote me on that. Go look at the notes. You got them. Let's read it. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus, who is the Christ, the righteous one. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Here's the first thing I want us to see. John is writing because he wants to prevent sin, not condone it. God is light, and in him there is no, no darkness. No darkness. And y'all keep talking about you ain't got sin. It's a big deal. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, he's like, hey, but if you do sin. And so someone might can, like, accuse John of like, dude, what are you talking about? Like, didn't you just say this is a big deal? No, no, no. His point is, it is in your nature. You have sinned in the past, and you will sin in the future. This is a reality, and when that happens, you must remember that you have an advocate, a parakletos, someone who is called alongside, someone who is like your attorney, your defense attorney, who is there speaking on your behalf. He is there with you or for you. And he is none other than Jesus, who is the Christ, the Messiah, the one who died for your sins, and he is righteous. That is why he is making such a big deal. He's not condoning sin. He's actually wanting to prevent it. But if we do, this is the gracious allotment that God has made for us, right? He's recognizing that there is a reality that we have sin in our lives and in our nature and our actions. Are you tracking with that? He is immediately denying those three denials from the end of chapter 1. He's saying, no, 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 that's true. You do have sin in your nature. You do have sin in your past. You will sin in the future. And so he says... God's made a gracious provision for our sin and that Christ is our advocate. I want to read two verses for you. Write these down. John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. This is in the upper room discourse. Jesus and his boys, are, this is the last big conversation that he has with them in one big shot, like three chapters. <clears throat> John 14, 16 through 17. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. That word, helper, Parakletos, the exact same word as advocate. He will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, who is the Holy Spirit, right? Whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. If Jesus is saying, I'm promising to send another helper, what does that imply? Who was the one we already had? And what does John say? When you sin, you have an advocate with the Father up there. And what he says in the Gospel of John on Jesus' lips is, you also have another advocate where? In you now. Do you think this sounds like John condoning sin? No. He's encouraging them that if this is where our lives are found in our trust in Christ and not ourselves, this is what we have at our ready access, yeah? Yeah. So Christ is the advocate who is on our behalf, and he is perfectly righteous. He is the one who is the righteous one. The same way that in God there is no, no darkness, that in Christ, in Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he is completely 
righteous. That's the only reason what chapter 2, uh, two verse 2 uh, is going to work with propitiation. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. And here's the last thing. You need to note that the righteous one is the only one who can cleanse us of our unrighteousness. Lauren, I love you. I cannot remove your unrighteousness because I'm jacked up just like you. Sorry. As much as I love her, as much as I would want to do that, I can't. We need someone external to us who is completely righteous to handle my unrighteousness, right? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Yeah? All right. It's chapter 2, verse 1. Let me talk about chapter 2, verse 2, and then we'll have some time. 2, verse 2. He, speaking of Jesus Christ, who is the righteous, Jesus the Messiah, right? He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So I asked y'all earlier, how many of y'all have heard this word, know what it means? You tell me, what does this word propitiation mean? Christine. The appeasement of God's wrath. I like that. Somebody else? Gary. Atonement. That's good. In fact, I'll go ahead and throw it up there. Sometimes it may even be translated as atoning sacrifice. Okay? So if we break that, that phrase apart, that there's a sacrifice, something has to die, and a sacrifice in biblical terms is something that dies in your place, and that atonement is something that is removing what? God's wrath. Okay? Anybody have another translation in chapter 2, verse 2, instead of propitiation? You most likely have something like atonement or sacrifice or straight-up propitiation. Okay? All right, so we're on, that, on the same page there. Here's the deal. That is what this is translated as, but here's technically what we're talking about. It is the legal means by which a debt is settled. Let's be incredibly clear. What is the debt that you owe to God? What do you owe him in order to be accepted by him? You don't owe death yet. You can avoid death if you are perfect. If you're completely perfect, that's what you are expected to be. No sin. That is what you're expected to be. Incidentally, that's what the Gnostics were claiming, and John's like, but you fail that test. Well, since all of us have sin, what then is the debt that we owe since we can't be perfect? There will be death and that is technically what we describe as God's wrath. Have I introduced y'all to God yet? This is God, in case y'all didn't know. What color is God? Just yelled out, what color is, is God here? Blended, okay. Multicolored. What colors do you see of the primary ones? Blue, purple, silver. Yellow? Honestly, it depends on what angle you're looking at him, right? And what's written on the outside of God here is all sorts of attributes of God. And the one that I want to talk about right now is God's wrath. And here's the deal. What Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 is that we, whenever we are outside of Christ, we, like all mankind, are objects of God's wrath, just like everyone else, because we have sin in our nature. There's a debt that we owe. But thanks to be to God that because of the great love with which he has loved us, he has caused us to be born again. And that comes through trusting in Christ. And instead of getting wrath, you know what we get? Mercy. You see how wrath and mercy, this are attributes of God. These may be two of the furthest things away from each other in God's nature. And you may only really ever experience one. But make no mistake... That is who God is. In a very similar way, we see also God's justice. And what's on the opposite side of God's justice? Well, you could say mercy, but you could also say his love. Here's my point. In order for us to actually receive salvation, we need someone to pay our debt. That term is propitiation. And what Jesus is, is he is the one who is the wrath averter. He averts God's wrath that rightly would fall on me. And who does it fall on now? Himself. It is no longer something that is going to be 
limited just to me because of Jesus and what he has done. He averts it. And that's why he's the propitiation. So let's talk about the four necessary elements for propitiation to be a real thing. You're going to love this. All right, number one, whenever we are talking about a debt, remember, this is the terminology we're talking about, this debt of perfection and righteousness. Here's how that debt has to be paid. It has to be paid with the proper currency. If you owe a debt of $100 every month to some loan agency or whatever, and you show up with 100 pesos, are you good? You got the wrong currency. Here's the point. You have to have the blood of a sinless sacrifice. Lauren, I love you. I want to atone for your unrighteousness. And if I die for you, we're both in the same boat. Because I am not sinless. It's the wrong currency, right? It's categorically different. You seeing that? You got to have the proper currency. Second thing is you need to have the proper amount. If you owe $100 and you show up with 90, is your debt paid? No, you are a dollar short at least. That's why we need the blood of a divine sacrifice. What we see clearly in the Old Testament is that there is this blood of one man is worth the blood of another. And we normally put that in terms of like retributive justice, that if there is a murder, that life of the person who took someone else's life is demanded of them because they are equal. So again, Lauren, I love you. If I want to die for you, I, okay, let's suppose that works. But the moment that I want to die for Philip, too, well, now he's hosed. Because my blood ain't that rich, right? You've got to have the proper currency. You've got to have the proper amount. It's got to be done at the proper place. You owe $100 to the mortgage place or whoever, whatever the debt is, and you show up at Walmart and just give them 100 bucks. Is your debt square? No. The clear evidence from the Old Testament is that the sacrifices that are in the temple and the tabernacle, all the ones that are being made there, they are but a shadow of the thing that is happening in heaven. And then whenever Christ makes his sacrifice, he is essentially making that before the host of heaven. And so whenever Jesus is dying on the cross, yes, but the temple curtain is torn from the top to the bottom, showing the separation that was there between where God resides in the most holy place and everywhere else. It doesn't exist anymore because Jesus made the sacrifice at the right place. You see in that? You've got to have the proper currency. You've got to be the proper amount. got to be at the proper place. And it's got to be at the proper time. You come showing up with 100 bucks, you can come showing up with 110 bucks. A day late or a week late, have you paid your debt? No. And I'm not talking about like the Romans form where Paul says that at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. I am talking about before the foundations of the world. There was this appeasement of God's wrath because Christ is settling our debt before we were even a twinkle in your daddy's eye, right? That is how this works. Got to have the proper currency, amount, place, and time. This is the mechanics of salvation. If you've never understood why Jesus' death on the cross and you accepting him, if you've never understood why that forgives your debt and cleanses you of all unrighteousness, it's because of these four reasons right here. Tracking with that? All right. I'm done. Paul, what you got? Mm -hmm. Satisfaction, another meaning of propitiation, yeah. Yes. He satisfies God's wrath. That's the debt, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, I'm right there with you. All right, anything else that we want to talk about from chapter 1, 5 through 2, 2? We've got about another 10 minutes. Paul. Mm hmm It's aeon, yes. So it's a subjunctive indicator, yes. I'm looking at the Greek, by the way. That's what this little goofy book here is. Well, the way that's translated is that's introducing a third-class conditional statement, and a third-class conditional statement is the author writing, if we say, and then whatever, and he is assuming the positive response. If we say, and I know you are, that's how it's coming about. So if we say that, uh, I'm sorry, if we confess our sins, I'm sorry, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, right? 
And he is saying, if we confess, and you will, he is faithful and just. That may be what you're referencing with the three different things. It's a third class conditional statement. There's four of those that show up in chapter 1, verse 6, uh, 8, 9, and then later in uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Yes, sir. Mm hmm. Neither. I would say there's no but, there's no and, it's just if. Yes. I'm impl Okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. I am implying, even when I read it, I said, however, verse 9, I am implying that there is a clear contrast. The reason why I'm indicating that there's a clear contrast is because that's exactly what he does. He does in the first third class conditional statement in verses 6 and 7. He does something very similar here. And in verse 10, he says something that is, he's, offering a clear rebuttal to it. So I'm, I'm, I'm supplying the however, but that may be what you're getting at. And I'm doing that because I think that's the way it's intended to be translated. It should be, yes. And it's not in the Greek either, is what I'm saying to you. But I think there's plenty of times where it's implied. That's perfectly fine. Because, and I think that is right to say that if your translation has, but if we confess our sins, I think that is the implied meaning because in verse eight, it's, we don't have a sin nature, but if we confess, that implies that we know we have a sin nature and that we actively, volitionally participate in sin. Yep. Okay. Other questions? Ashley. Mm hmm Chalasmas is the word. Well, whenever you're looking at that, with that word for halosmos, that is actually a noun. It's not a, there is no verb. There's no verbal aspect of something that is continual or not. It is just, he is the propitiation. A lot of times when you have abstract nouns, which this is, they'll drop a definite article so there's no the. But if you translate it as, he is the propitiation, that would be 100% correct. Because um, a lot of times whenever it follows a copulative vowel, uh, noun, or, sorry, verb, with Eston, it just drops it. But he is the um, atoning sacrifice, the halosmos propitiation, and that is implied that he is presently and actively. So it is an ongoing. That's probably your answer there. I'm sorry. I, it took me a bit to get there, but I'm tracking with you. Yeah. And it's not something that has to continually happen over and over again, because that's what the book of Hebrews is about. There's one sacrifice for all time, and then he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Why did he sit down? The work's done. He ain't got to keep working. He's done. Okay? Yep, and it's getting at the same idea. He is the sacrifice that atones, yeah. So I, I join those together of atoning sacrifice. That's functionally the same as the sacrifice that atones. New Living, by the way, was translated in such a way that it is meant to be read out loud, and so it's just going to sound more pleasing. You're not going to have a bunch of really big words jammed next to each other. Um, ESV is translated in such a way that it's meant to be as accurate to the words, even the word order. And when we do that, sometimes it gets kind of goofy. So, so that's why there's a difference there that accounts for that. All right. I got one minute left. Not really. We'll, just, we'll, we'll, we'll skip the discussion questions. We'll come back around. Yes, yeah, so to talk about the difference between expiation, expiation is the idea of I'm just going to remove the penalty. I'm just going to remove it. I'm going to waive the consequences. That is actually seen in chapter 1, verse 9. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us. There's your idea of expiation. Here it is propitiation where there is a payment that is demanded. There is something that must be satisfied, and there's no waiving it. That wrath falls on someone. Who does that wrath fall on? Jesus. So that's the difference between uh, 
expiation, something that is just taken away, and something that is propitiation, that I am giving satisfaction for this. Thank you for reminding me. Ed. Okay, seems like there's a second theme. What is that? Fellowship. Fellowship. Yeah. With us and. Yep, and that's what we talked about. This is a family-style fellowship, yes? Yep, absolutely. So I think this is one of those themes that we can trace all sorts of different themes. Um, First John is notoriously difficult for outlining. In fact, there you go. All three of these books outline it radically different from each other. What I'm doing is I'm trying to give us the broad middle of where I think some of the ideas fit together. So let's recap those ideas. Chapter 1, verse 5, God is light and there's no darkness in him at all. But you fools have got sin in your life, and y'all keep lying about it. You say your sin doesn't break fellowship with God, you keep saying you don't have sin in your nature, and you keep saying you ain't never sinned. And all of that is junk. And I'm telling you it's junk, chapter 2, verse 1, because you have an advocate for this very purpose. He is the righteous one, and chapter 2, verse 2, he's the only reason that you don't feel the wrath of that sin. You see how those are logically connected? And then he kind of jumps ship in chapter 2, verse 3. Next week, we're going to be looking at chapter 2, verses 3 through 6 with this first test. So if you remember the three circles that we have up there, there are three tests. That's the very first thing we're going to talk about next week. I'll remind us of all those there. Yeah? All right. Any other questions that we've had? All right. I would highly encourage you all to look at those discussion questions that I handed out last time. Um, The idea of light. Um... I had some lyrics from a band from a song that I just put out that I really like that I think really hits on this idea of light, but we ain't got time. Come talk with me later. I'll get you hooked up, right? But here's the deal. Whenever we see these themes coming out, whether it is fellowship, whether it is light, whether it is love, John is using those word pictures as a means to motivate us to have our lives changed by Jesus. That's the whole point. He's going to use very stark contrasts to motivate us to some truth, okay? So there are those questions, and the other ones are this. The question I really wanted to ask is this, and this is the one I do want you to ponder. Have you ever considered the mechanics of salvation, which is what we talk about propitiation? It has to be at the proper currency, proper amount, proper place, proper time. And the question is, do you have to understand all of the depth of those mechanics in order to believe in the believe in the doctrine. And what I would tell you is, no, you don't have to understand every little bit of it, but I think understanding it makes you believe in it even more. So consider those things. All right, here's your homework for next week. Continue memorizing 1 John 1, 9. I'm going to call on more folks, and I want you to start memorizing 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. We're going to be talking firmly about love whenever we get there. Let's just read it real quick. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's going to stand in for a huge chunk of basically chapter 2, verse 7, all the way through 18, uh, 17 or 18. It's going to be this idea of love. So start memorizing 1 John 2, 15. Um, read the section, read the chapter, read the book, how I've instructed you. And lastly, I have discussion questions for next week. Okay. Next week, we're looking at literally like three verses. So we're going to have a lot more time for discussion. Um, we're going to build it out that way, but you need to grab one of these questions. Phil, if you want to hand these out as people are rolling out. Phil will be kind of standing around in the back. I'm going to pray for us, and if you've got questions, you can come up here. We'll get us taken care of, yeah? All right, let me pray. Father, I thank you that we have so clearly laid out for us uh, the mechanics of salvation with what it is that Jesus has done for us and how he has paid our debt and satisfied wrath that was rightly to fall on us. God, I pray that this drives us to recognize the presence of sin in our lives and that we would be quick to confess that sin, that we would be quick to come to a point where we recognize that we need 
forgiveness and that we need cleansing and that you are the only one who is faithful and just to do so. Father, I pray that you would help us understand that and that would impact how we live even today. And we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right, next week, chapter 2, verses 3, 4, 5, and 6. That's it.